Good to see smiling faces. Good to have the sun shine out. Let's worship the Lord together this morning, all right? Holy is the Lord, God. 
Lord. morning we feel freedom I know after this week we probably feel a little bit more chained down uh, just with what's going on in the world and in our country but I want to pray for us and and people that are free respond in such a way and so if you're comfortable and you feel like you feel the freedom Jesus brings this morning and you want to lift your hands as just a sign of freedom you're welcome to do that I want to pray for us Jesus uh, you 
You have set us free. You have made a way. You have met us where we are. You have come to us. And we are a people um, that are grateful. We are people that are humbled. We understand the freedoms we have. We understand what you've done for us, what you've given us. Not only from our sin, but from our cell phones and our texts. But Jesus, we love you and we are grateful for all the blessings, all the freedom, all the gifts that you give to us so freely. You're good to us, Jesus. And so we, we say that to you this morning. We love you, Father. We worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, after our time together today, uh, we're going to have a business meeting for the church to vote on our budget. If uh, you're not able to stay and you're one of the members, there'll be a place out here you can go ahead and vote. But I uh, invite anyone to hang around if you'd like to. Let's pray again. God, this is your church. We are so grateful that you're in the process of building your church, your way. Thank you for these who have come up. Thank you for those who are listening to the video, God. We, we trust that this is going to be a special time because you are here. You said where two or three are gathered. You are right there in the midst of us. And so we want to yield our lives, our hearts, our minds, our very beings to you, thanking you that you are the great and sovereign God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I guess we kind of assumed that this stage would kind of come eventually with this pandemic where we start real strong and we're ready to climb the mountain and then as time goes on, it gets a little harder and a little harder, a little harder. Obviously, we've had a lot of different restrictions that have come along that have kind of forced us to start thinking more about school and kids and jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, I guess I kind of felt like, you know, after a little while, you know, okay, I think I'll take maybe a two-week vacation from God. And then it's three weeks, and then four weeks, and I don't know about you, but it just seemed like it's getting harder and harder to kind of connect with God, and I, I can't help but think that there is a desire on the enemy's part to kind of shift us into neutral so that some point we'll just kind of have a spiritual failure. And I want to talk about how we can keep that from happening today because I think God does want to use times like this to help us crystallize our purpose and our goal and what we're all about and to figure out how we can band together. Uh, yeah, it's difficult for us to recharge our batteries because we can't meet in our home groups, we can't meet here quite as often uh, and stuff, but God still wants us to be ready and, and able to follow Him. We're going to look at one particular person who really had a major spiritual failure. Matter of fact, the night before Jesus died, two of Jesus' very best friends had a major spiritual failure. You know who they were, don't you? Judas and Peter. Judas rejected the very mercy of God and ended up killing himself. Peter, on the other hand, denied God, but he received and accepted the mercy, the forgiveness, the love of God. He ended up leading the church and launching the church. And so we look at these two people and say, wow, we want to be like Peter. We want to learn from the mistakes that Peter made. So we're going to look this morning at the different causes for spiritual failure. Well, what's the causes why we kind of end up slipping back a little bit? We lose that spiritual edge. We kind of go into a spiritual neutral. And then I want to talk about what causes it? What's the cure? What, what can we do right now? What are some of the things that I hope we are doing to kind of keep the spiritual fires going? Then I want to close by talking about what Jesus does with us in a time when spiritual temptation, uh, spiritual failure is at the door. I hope it will be very encouraging for you. We start off then by talking about what are the causes for spiritual failure. Number one, we overestimate our strength. This is what dear Peter did. Peter thought he was strong enough he would never ever deny his Lord. But he found out he eventually did. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31. Jesus said, tonight... Every one of you will desert me. Stop there a second. How many do you say are going to desert him? Just Judas and just Peter? How many? Everyone. Everyone. We've got to realize that all of us can have this spiritual failure. All of us can say, well, we're just going to veer away from God a short time, a short time, and it just keeps going and keeps going. He says, every one of you will desert me. Scripture says that when the shepherd is killed, the sheep will be scattered. 
But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee, meet you there. Then Peter boasted, and you know we love Peter, don't we? But Lord, even if everyone else fails you, I will never deny you. Jesus replied, Peter, the truth is that before this night is over, and before the rooster crows at dawn, you will deny knowing me, not once, not twice, but three times. Peter insisted, but Lord, I would never do that, even if I have to die with you. I'll never deny knowing you. And all the other disciples bowed the same thing. Isn't it interesting? We look at Peter, and we say, Peter made this amazing vow, but look at that last verse there. All the other disciples chimed in. We vow the very same thing. We've got to be cautious here, don't we? We've got to be realistic. We think that while we are continuing to walk with God and walk with God, we wouldn't fall. But you never know when Satan is going to come in and pull us away. And here we see that he overestimated his strength, his ability to do it. I mean, sometimes people in business do that. They overestimate and they end up falling. Sometimes in marriages, you, end, you think that, wow, you're really strong. There's no way you could fall away, but you end up falling away. Kids in school sometimes, they overestimate how much they know, and they flunk their test. The military battles sometimes are lost because they've overestimated their strength. I'm calling you to be honest today, to be sober, to be honest and realistic that, you know, you could decide to shift into spiritual neutral on an ongoing basis. And God says, I want you to be careful to know that you can at any particular moment not handle what you think you can't handle. We're tempted to say things like that. Oh, I, I'm strong enough. I know I can handle it. I won't bother me. Nothing's going to hold me back. Well, let Peter be an example. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. You know the verse. If you think I'm strong, I can handle this. I'll never fall for that temptation. Be careful. You could easily fall. It's sad to hear the reports of some of our single adults who, as they go off to college and come back, have we thought they were very, very strong, but they are now admitting we're not as strong as we thought and we're kind of drifting away from our faith. Satan is always knocking at the door wanting to pull us back. And with the right circumstances, I think any of us would have to admit that we can fail. I don't think Peter woke up that morning and said, Oh, I'm going to go out and deny my Lord. It just happened. So I pray even today that as you're reflecting upon the Lord and reflect upon what He's doing in your life, that you too would be sober and realize don't overestimate even the long spiritual walk that you've had before. Be careful. The second cause of spiritual failure is we fear the disapproval of other people. We kind of go along to get along. I don't know about you, but there's times when I'm reluctant to admit that I'm a Christian to others because I don't want them to think bad things about me. And that's exactly what Peter fell into, didn't it? Matthew 26 and verse 58. Peter followed at a distance. Are you following Jesus at a distance? He followed Jesus at a distance to the courtyard of the high priest's palace. He went in, sat down with the guards to see what was going to happen to Jesus. He's kind of curious what's going to happen here. As he, Peter, was sitting in the courtyard, a servant girl came up to him and said, You, you were with Jesus of Galilee, weren't you? But standing there in front of everyone, that's the key, in front of everyone, Peter denied even knowing what you're talking about, he said. I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know if you can put yourself in Peter's shoes. He got to see Jesus do miracles. He got to hear Jesus teach like no one else had ever taught. He saw Jesus raise the dead. And yet when he was tested in his faith, he too fell. So number one today, just realize that, wow, it's possible for you, for me, to shift into spiritual neutral and fall away. If we start falling at a distance, and I appreciate those of you who keep showing up for this, those of you who are listening to the video, those who are staying in the Word of God, don't fall at a distance. Stay close because we put one foot in the Christian world and one in the real world and we're going to do splits, right? We're going to go. And God says, I want you to be careful. So we need to pause if we're going to be careful that we don't have a spiritual failure and ask ourselves, honestly, whose opinion is it that I honor even above what God says? 
We all have people that we want to like us, to approve of us. And it's important for us to identify who are those people, those things that end up kind of becoming an idol, really, in our lives. Be honest for yourself. Why, why is it that I sometimes cringe at criticism? Well, why, what is it? What is it that sometimes I'm, my stomach turns when somebody disagrees with me? It's really kind of going back to that root rejection that probably all of us had at some point in our lives. That we're just always afraid that's going to happen again. So we need people to like us. And that is one of the causes that we can have spiritual failure. We begin to seek other people's approval rather than God's. Proverbs 29 and verse 25. Look at the way he says it. It's a dangerous trap to be concerned with what others think of you. But if you trust the Lord, you'll be safe. I probably ought to stop here and just take a vote. How many of us would say there really are some other people's opinions out there that really have a pretty major influence on in my life? Anybody willing to kind of just be honest there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just normal. And we ought to respect them. We ought to love them. But I imagine each of us are going to be called upon in this time period to at some point choose God rather than what they're saying. And that's going to be the real test. Be careful. You say, oh, I can handle it. Don't bother. It doesn't bother me. Nothing really is going to happen here. I can do it. So cause of failure, overestimating our strength. Be honest. A cause of failure is the approval of others. Who is it that we've got to be careful and not listen to above God? The third thing is Peter showed us we can speak without thinking. Aren't we, isn't he famous for this? He puts his mouth in, out there before he even puts his mind in gear. He says, you know, I'm just going to express my feelings. That's a sign of mark of a real strong person. No, that's a small mark of an immature person. We, we shouldn't be speaking without knowing what we're wanting to say. We had a great time over Thanksgiving, and my wife put in a lot of work putting it together, and on the way home, I made a comment, I think, I can't believe I said it, you know, I just wanted to kind of say a little joke, I said, wow, and I mean, I absolutely did nothing, okay, you got to get that clear, really, <laughs> zip, zero, nothing, I did nothing, but I made the little comment, well, I'm just glad everything I put together here came out good, I'm glad she didn't laugh, she didn't respond, she didn't hit me either, I mean, I have to, have to give her credit. But, but I thought about that day after day. I thought, why in the world would I say something like that? It doesn't make sense. But that's the way that we can begin that spiritual fall. We begin walking away. And, and that's what happens. The little girl comes up to Peter in verse 71 of chapter 26 of Matthew. Then Peter went out to the entrance of the courtyard. And there another woman saw him and said to those standing there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it. And this time he swore an oath and said, I don't even know that man. But after a while, the men who had been standing there, there's some others standing around, came over to Peter and said, we know that you're one of them. That's the kiss of death, isn't it? You're one of them. You're one of those Christians over there. You're one of those fanatics over there. He didn't want to be one of them them Christians. He wanted to be one of those around. And as a result, this approval from other people came in really strong. Verse 73, we know that you're one of them because your Galilean accent gives you away. Now, those of us with a southern accent are a little bit sensitive at this particular point. We think, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I thought about this. Let me just do a little diversion here just to have fun with you. Jesus' resurrection body was very similar to his earthly body. And in his earthly body, he had an accent. Is it possible that in his resurrection body, he had an accent? Is it possible in heaven we're going to have an accent? Is it possible we're going to speak southernese in heaven? Huh? What's going on here? Yeah. Oh, you don't have to vote on that. Okay. <laughs> the point was, his accent gave him away. He couldn't deny it. There's something about you, there's something about me, that people look at and say, you're a Christian. That's good. But we have to realize they're going to put the pressure. Verse 74, Peter lost his temper. He started cursing and swearing. He shouted, I don't know the man. Immediately he heard a rooster crow. 
stop and think about what happened here. I mean, he's, he's afraid. <laughs> he put all his eggs in the basket of Jesus, and now Jesus is looking like he's going to get defeated and tortured and killed. He's getting scared. And when we get emotionally, we get scared, we start swearing. We show our anger, and emotion kind of takes over. And I've discovered that people who end up swearing a lot, they're really kind of throwing logic out the window. They've given up on logic, when in their case, they're going to try to, to use uh, these words to say that. And so I think he's saying here that Peter says, you know, I'm just so afraid. I want people's attention. I, I speak without really thinking. Well, I have to be careful because I'm overestimating my strength. So these are the things that Peter did wrong. Don't you like it? Look like it that sometimes you have somebody in the Bible who does things wrong who could say, yeah, that's what I do also. Now we're going to look at three things that Peter did right. Okay? Here's, if you're going to be sober about this being, not being over, over stretching your strength, if you're not going to be careful, you're going to be careful not to have people want, have to be have a preview all the time and you're going to speak. He says, number one, look at verse 75. When Peter heard the rooster crow, he remembered that Jesus had said, Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Then Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Circle that little phrase. Wept bitterly. When was the last time that you wept over sin? Wow. When was the last time that you grieved your heart, because you grieve the heart of God. The first step I think you want to write down your outline there is we have to learn how to grieve. We have to learn how to express sorrow, to express disappointment, to admit and be humble. It's pretty tempting. I, I find it's pretty tempting and when something goes wrong that I'll begin to explain myself away. <laughs> you know, I, I'll begin to blame somebody else. I pretend that it really wasn't all that bad. I'll downplay what's going on there. But Peter, we love him because he failed big time, but he repented big time. He grieved his decision. Think about it this way. If we don't grieve our sin, we're probably going to repeat it. Because if we don't grieve, it, doesn't, it means we haven't really learned what went wrong at that particular point. I mean, as a businessman or businesswoman fails in a business and then immediately the next day opens up a new business, doesn't grieve that process and learn from it, you know they're going to fail again. If someone has difficulty in a marriage and they just kind of walk out, if they don't grieve that and learn what went wrong, they'll do the same thing again. And so here, Peter is such a great example of being able to grieve instead of just this pushing it away, he grieves and feels the heart of God, and as a result, he's going to be able to really, really change. Look at it this way. A little Coke can here. Anybody want a Coke? No. Huh? It's, it's free. It's free. You don't want this. Well, I don't understand why you don't want it. I mean, here, I'll just open it. it I'll just put it up here. Right, here, I'll put it this way. This one I didn't shake. <laughs> you can come up and get one afterwards, take your chances. What, what am I pointing here? If we don't grieve, we keep those, stuff those emotions down inside, eventually they're going to explode when you don't expect it. And so here we see a good principle from Peter being willing to grieve, to express his sorrow, to express his emotion, recognizing that, wow, if I don't, I could really fall again and again. Verse 75 of Matthew 26, When Peter heard the rooster crow, he remembered that Jesus said, Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Then Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Put yourself in Peter's shoes. How do you, how do you think he really felt inside when he did that? After watching Jesus for three and a half years and do these miracles and teaching and how many times he forgave, no doubt his heart was broken himself. And good grief can actually bring healing in our lives. Are you willing to do that? You got some pain? We got pains. It's so easy to try to ignore them and push them away. But God says, I want you to grieve it. I want you to process it. I want you to admit you're human in the process because as you do it, you're releasing the pressure so that you won't explode in the process. 
in the process of grieving, you're able to learn what God wants you to learn. So here's the bottom line. I, I believe we all want to keep from failing spiritually. We don't want to drift backwards. We don't want to fall into a spiritual neutral. We don't want to overestimate our strength. Or we don't want to with approval of others. We don't want to speak without really thinking about what we're doing. Well, here's what you need to do. We need to ask God, what is it you're trying to teach me? Because I want to learn the mistakes that I'm making so I don't make them again. Would you be willing to do that this week? Two or three times this week. Just say, God, what is it that you're asking me to learn in this situation? The bigger the situation we've been in, the longer it's going to take for us to kind of learn what God has for us. But it all begins, doesn't it, with honesty. Admitting, I have made a mistake and I need to grieve. Remember when David committed sin with Bathsheba? Psalm 51 expresses his heart of confession, of grieving. Look at it. The sacrifice God wants is a broken and a contrite spirit. God will not reject a humble, repentant heart. He confesses. He admits. He's sincere. He says, I didn't realize, and as you go back and look at Psalm 51, he, he says, I, I didn't just sin against man, I sinned against God. And as a result, it grieved his heart. It, it bummed him out. And I can't help but think that this poor rooster, <laughs> every time that rooster crowed, any time, I guess Peter must have been reminded. Wow. And here's what I want to emphasize here. It's fine to have the different triggers in our life that remind us of the painful times, but, but I think it ought to remind us of the grace of God. That's what you see in the life of Peter. The rooster was a sign that, yes, your Lord even predicted this is going to happen. And now, <laughs> Woo! my goodness, <laughs> did I offend one back over there somewhere? <laughs> oh, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? The second, <laughs> we'll just pause and let the rooster see you. <laughs> For those in the movie, you can hear there's a rooster back here crowing. So, uh, first thing then, we need to learn to grieve, okay? This is a hard time we're going through. We have to admit it. It's tough. And we need to process that. Writing journals or talking or, or whatever. One of the reasons I find it so difficult uh, not getting together is we don't have someone to process. With, process. I'm just amazed how many of the small groups <laughs> continue to meet together because they want to process the agony of these days. Second thing I want you to see that Peter does though. And we're having a hard time doing this right now, but we've got to keep it on the front burner. He let his home group support him. Jesus formed a home group when he started the ministry, right? That's one of the first things he did. Why do you think Jesus did that? Because he knew. Look, this guy's having fun out there, isn't he? <laughs> he knew there was going to be difficult days that are coming. And he formed friendships with those who could help him. Look at Matthew, Mark 16, verse 10. Mary Magdalene went and found the disciples, this is after Christ's death, together grieving and weeping. I love it. I love it. You think that grieving and weeping, they met, continue to meet together. It's tempting, isn't it? Just to isolate ourselves. We're kind of forced to do it in some ways, the culture of culture. Just insulate our we need help from other people. Now there's temptations with some areas that we fail in. You know, if we go through a bankruptcy or there's abortion or there's some kind of failed marriage that we feel bad about, we don't want to share with people, but that's the ones we need to share. Because that's when we need the support from those around us. Mark 16 and verse 10. Mary Magdalene went and found the disciples together, grieving and weeping together. Look at John 20, verse 19. That evening, the disciples were together. There they are again. With the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, suddenly Jesus appeared in the middle of the group and said, Peace be with you. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. That was their recourse, to be together to be able to share their hearts. I don't know about you. I, I've been in home groups, small groups for decades. Now, I've never had Jesus appear physically in one, but I've had his voice come clear in many of them as somebody in the group was sharing, as somebody read a Bible verse, as somebody had an answer to prayer. It was as if God himself was talking directly to me. 
So I don't know how you do it. I'm finding right now a lot of our groups are feeling comfortable meeting together, but still individually people are meeting together. So whatever it takes, whatever you feel comfortable with, we need to try to do it. I never thought about this before, but you know that God promises to come to your home group. You say, wow, there's just two of us. You know the verse, don't you? Matthew 18 and verse 20. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there in the midst of them. God says, take that extra effort. Take that effort, extra energy to make sure you're with other people. Process the trauma that you're going through. So number one, he grieved. Number two, he led his home group support him. Number three, he humbly received God's mercy. This is, I want to kind of camp on this one a little bit. This is where Judas went wrong. Judas did not receive the mercy of God. But Peter did. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Peter comes back after going through his life. He writes this. Because of his, God's great mercy, God has given us a new life. I mean, if anybody needed a new life, it was Peter after falling, right? By raising Jesus Christ from death, this fills us with a living hope. Uh, you and I are honest with our spiritual pilgrimage up and down and up and down. We, we can kind of get paralyzed in, in shame and guilt and condemnation. I think God wants us at a time like this right now to dwell on the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness of God. And also receive God's mercy. We have to let go of some of that pain to be able to get it. God says, I want you now to receive the blessings of God, the mercy of God. And you say, well, I don't deserve it. You're right. I don't deserve it either. And that's the reason we love Jesus, because He is merciful. He shuts Satan's voice of accusation down when we receive the mercy of God. The final question I want to answer is, what does God do when I fail? What does God do when I slip into spiritual neutral? And I'm not trying to follow, when I'm not following quite as much as I really think I should. Luke 22 and verse 30 is really interesting. Simon, Simon, Peter's name before, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan wants to sift you. He wants to turn your Christ. He wants to test you. He wants to destroy you. But Jesus said, I have prayed for you in advance that your faith should not fail. So when, not if, look at that, you have repented and turned back to me again, strengthen and build up your brothers. He said, I'm going to predict you, Peter. You're, you're going to go through a rough time. I'm going to also predict, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to also predict, you're going to repent. I'm finally going to predict, you're going to be used by God to strengthen other people as a result of your falling. First thing I want you to notice here is, what does God do? He's not shocked by our disobedience. He's not shocked when we begin to fade away. We don't catch him off guard. Psalm 103, verse 14. God certainly knows what we are made of. He bears in mind that we are dust. He knows that we're going to mess up. We're going to flub up. We're going to just cause all kinds of problems. But His grace, His mercy, continues to flow out over and over and over again. God knows our weakness. He also knows the tricks that Satan wants to bring in our life. Secondly, Jesus prays for you. Do you see that? But I have prayed for you, Peter says. Now, as your pastor, I love praying for you, but I have an amazing news for you. God is praying for you too. What do you think Jesus might be praying for you right now? I know one thing he's praying. He's praying that you'll experience and appreciate the forgiveness of God and let the accusations of Satan go way beyond. A lot of things that Jesus could be praying, but you ought to know, Jesus is praying for you. Hebrews 7, 25. Jesus is able to save us completely because He lives to intercede on our behalf. He's always talking to the Father, asking Him to help us. Wow! The third thing is, God believes in us. He's depending on us and trusting that we're going to repent and come back to God. Look at it. Simon, Simon, Simon Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith should not fail. 
So when you have repented, not if, when you repented, turn back to me again, strengthen and build up your brothers in Christ. God can have confidence in us because we have the Holy Spirit within us. But we have to keep open and honest and ready for Him to work in our life. Proverbs 24 and verse 16, For even though a righteous man falls seven times, he will rise again. Even good Christians, even good people will fall. But we want to fall back on the very grace of God. And the thing I want to emphasize here is that it's not just one big package of mercy that God gives us. He gives us mercy after mercy after mercy when we sin after sin after sin. It's those daily sins that rock us the most. And I want you, are you willing to receive the mercy of God? It seems to me God is a lot more ready to give you His mercy than you are to receive it. Would you forgive yourself? Today, would you receive the grace of God? Would you receive His mercy in your life? Point number four, God shows mercy when we are down. When we're down, God doesn't come along and pile it on and kind of remind us of all the other mistakes that we've made. Scorn us. He simply says, no, I'm willing to give you the grace of God in your life. Wish you could see all the roosters back in the back back there. There's a bunch of them coming to church. Come on! <laughs> uh, you ever had somebody betray you? Yeah, you have. And, and then how did you respond to that person? Can you imagine doing what Jesus did with Peter? Peter denied Jesus in his moment. He really needed him. But we learn in John chapter 20, that, 21 that when Jesus comes back, he sees the disciples out trying to catch some fish. And they caught no fish at all. And instead of being me, he said, aha, that deserves it. You shouldn't do it. You resisted me. He does a miracle. You remember? Throw your nets on the other side. They catch 153 fish. And then John 21 says, Jesus now said, now come and have some breakfast. Jesus said, now they were sure it really was the Lord Jesus served them bread, bread and the fish. This is the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. I don't know if we can put ourselves in that situation, but Peter must have been amazed. I denied you. I turned my back on you. And now you're inviting me to breakfast. You're doing a miracle for me. That's the mercy of God in your life. Lamentations 3 and verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. God doesn't say, I'm tired of martial sinning. God doesn't say, I've had enough of all his failures. God doesn't say, I'm not going to work with him any longer. He's merciful. <laughs> and he wants to keep working with us at all times. The final point here I want to let you see is that God uses our spiritual failures to build his church. This is, this is amazing. Peter blew it. But God uses him to build the church. Luke 22 and verse 32. When you have returned back to me, strengthen and build up your brothers. The brothers are the church. God wants to use your failures and my failures to build up other people. Isn't that just amazing? So I want you to understand that when Peter came in front of Jesus and Jesus says, Do you love me? Three different times Jesus said, feed my sheep. Take care of my church. I want to use you to bring strength and grace to the church, those in the church. Matthew 16, verse 18, I'll close. I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So be close. Are you responding like Judas? Are you rejecting the mercy of God? Are you aware, like Peter, as bad as he fell, he received the grace, the mercy of God? Think about the contrast. Judas broke down. Jesus broke through. That's what we want to do. 